Okay, awesome. All right, we're going to jump into it. And we are starting a whole new Sefer, a new book, the book of Bamidbar, Numbers, which is very exciting. We get a big mazel tov for those who are joining us um, on a somewhat steady basis. We've done another book. And for those who are relatively new, we have an opportunity to do another book. So let's rock on number four out of five. So Bamidbar. So the theme in Bamidbar that we're opening up with is Vayikra was about a lot about the Mishkan and setting up the tabernacle, the Mishkan. And now we're going to get into the, the actual usage of the Mishkan, the travels in the, Mish, in, uh, in, the, in the desert. And the book starts off with an unusual concept or you know, for the Torah at least, and that is a census. We start off talking about how many Jewish people are there? How many have we got? So we wanna know why we're talking about this. Why is it important to know how many Jewish people they are? And more specifically, it's actually quite a lengthy description. I mean, we go through tribe after tribe, every single one, and uh, we spend 54 verses, the first 54 verses, the entire first chapter of Bamidbar is talking about the numbers. So why is that so important? That's one thing we're going to touch on today. The next thing that's talked about in this week's Parsha is the formations of the encampments of the Jewish people when they were traveling and resting in the desert. So they had a very unique setup. I'm actually going to show you here um, in the back of the stone edition art scroll Chumash, there is a very nice graphic of this. Let's find it. Um, 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 okay, if you happen to have it, it's on page 1344. And you can see here this like plus sign kind of thing, hang on. And this is a, a description of the setup of the, the camps of the Jewish people. So in the middle, you got that green, and that's where the Mishkan is. The Mishkan is in the green. And then surrounding it, you have the camp of Levi, of Levi. They were the ones who did the actual service in the Mishkan. And then surrounding that is all of the other tribes in a very special design. So if you were traveling in this time in the barren Egyptian deserts, you would see this unbelievable sight of this, this protocol, this like beautiful organized display of how the Jewish people traveled. And they're surrounded around the holiest physical concept that they had, which was the Mishkan. And uh, that is where the divine presence rested and surrounding that is the, you know, the, the Levites, the Levium, who, for lack of a better term, you know, are like the rabbis, even though that's not exactly how I would describe them, but they were the ones who are working and, and the, you know, the, the leaders of the people who are working with the Mishkan. And then surrounding that, you have everybody aligned. Each tribe had their own flag, their own banner, their own pride, and everybody was in this beautiful formation. So... What is the significance of that? I saw an idea that stuck out to me that I thought, I thought was fascinating. And that is when we make a big deal out of showing honor and respect and passion for our Judaism, that stays with us. And equally importantly, that gets passed on to our children. So this was like a big deal. I mean. You can think of this in a in a smaller, you know, more relevant manner. I don't know how many of you here know that there are laws of how you're supposed to fold an American flag. Does anybody know how to fold it? Suzette, you know how to fold it? Uh, that's my kids do, but I don't. But you're right. There are okay, <laughs> excellent. So you know, you'd normally see that 
in like military ceremonies where the soldiers would, it, it's a whole, I don't know exactly how it is, but it's, it starts with two people often and they fold it. And, you know, it's not how you fold your dining room table tablecloth. It's a lot more precise than that, um, with more focus than that. And the point is that people who, who follow that respect the American flag and they respect what the American flag stands for. In this day and age, you know, the military, thankfully, is uh, very pro the American flag. Unfortunately, other places in America, they don't care as much, but at least they show the respect that they feel that the flag deserves. So that is a way of showing honor to what we are proud of. And on a much bigger level, that's what the Jewish people were doing when they followed all of this protocol and how they traveled and how they encamped. It made a very big and powerful impression on what we respect and what we honor. And what I think about, this triggered like a memory of mine in Israel. When I was living in Israel, I think one of the most powerful spiritual experiences that I had there, I don't know if any of you were uh, able to experience such a thing, was a Hachnasa Sefer Torah in Jerusalem, a celebration of bringing a new Torah scroll into a, you know, into a shul or into a yeshiva or into its new home. Uh, we've had that in Jacksonville. There was one actually a few months ago in Jacksonville, but in Israel, they take it to the next level. Like it's unbelievable. And it is so beautiful, the honor that they give the Torah. Now, of course, I don't want to make a comparison to Jacksonville because they have uh, many thousands time the Jewish population and infrastructure and ability to pull this off. I'm sure we would do this here if we had the ability to, but it is so beautiful to watch. You have this long procession that will come down the streets. All the streets will be closed and it'll start off with literally hundreds of children who line up on each side of the road holding a torch and a lit torch. And the children who are too young to safely hold a torch, which in Israel means you're like two, <laughs> they, they would hold a electric, you know, like an LED stick, and they would just line the streets, like almost sometimes for blocks and blocks, they'd be lining it. And then comes the big like canopy, which is all decorated. And you have thousands of men dancing and singing. And then all the women are on the side, front, back, right, left. And they're following along with this procession. And behind it is this, you know, the big truck, which has tons of lights and music. And as it's going down the street, every single person comes out of their apartment buildings when they hear such a thing happening and they join in the dancing or they stand on their balconies overlooking the street and they all show such tremendous honor to the Torah. And that's really what it's all about. I mean, you can imagine what kind of impression that would make on somebody. I used to, I used to find out where there was going to be one and run across town to a shul that I didn't know just to experienced this because it was such like a spiritual boost for me to take part in that. It is so unbelievable. And you can imagine the kids who are part of that, you know, they see what, where the party's at. When do Jewish people party? When do we really go all out and spare no expense? That is when there's a new Torah. And then the Torah comes to the shul and the other Torahs come out to greet it. I'll show you, I want to show you a few seconds, okay? If anybody hasn't seen this, I'm going to show you a few second video clip that I think is just so worth um, taking a peek at. Okay, so let me share, let me share my screen. Do you see this? Okay. Okay, this is the procession, and then you're going to see the, the kids as well.
Okay, that's a that's a lot of fun. I could watch that all day. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that's just such a beautiful display. And I think that the takeaway here for us is when we make a big deal out of what we do and we show our families and really we show ourselves what we value and what we will spend the money on, what we'll put the energy into, that is what will stay with us. The, the, what we honor most will be what we, you know, what makes the biggest impression on our hearts and our souls of where our priorities are. So that's what I see a little bit of a, of a message there, just in the grandness of the encampment of the Jewish people, which I can only assume put the Queen of England to shame. So <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's a little bit about that. Let's jump back to the beginning, though, because we, we just need to give a little clarity in why it was so important to count the Jewish people and why this was worth 54 verses in the Torah. So there's a couple of reasons that are mentioned. The Ramban, Nachmanides, says that one of the messages here is the love that Hashem has for the Jewish people and the incredible growth that the Jewish population saw. Because 210 years prior to the current status of the Jewish people in Egypt, uh, in, in the desert, 210 years prior, they had descended to Egypt with 70 people. And now they're at 603,000 military aged men, which is over well over 2 million, according to most estimates, including women and children. So that's an incredible rebirth of the Jewish people from uh, actually not rebirth, that is the birth of the Jewish people. It started from Avraham and Yitzchak and Yaakov and small, and this is when the population really exploded. And this is Hashem showing, look, look what you've got now. Look what I've done fulfilling his promise to Avraham and Yitzchak and Yaakov that their descendants will be, you know, numerous as the stars and the sand. Um, you know, we have a, a similar concept, you know, after our own horrific uh, version of Egypt, the Holocaust, even now to this day in Israel, all the newspapers will publish before Yom HaShoah, before Israel's Holocaust Remembrance, Remembrance Day, they will publish the numbers of how many Jewish people are in the world. And then, of course, also how many Jewish people are in Israel, which is like a staggering number relative to what it was when it was founded. Unfortunately, we aren't at pre-war population yet. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, we think about we know how much the Jewish people have grown in the last 70 years, but the, according to this past year's numbers, pre-Holocaust Jewish pop, worldwide Jewish population was 16.6 million, and now it's 15.2 million. So we're still 1.4 million short of what we wore before the war because of what Hitler did to the Jewish people. So we still have a ways to go, but it's still uh, you know beautiful to look at at growth and you know you can look at it both ways i know for a lot of holocaust survivors the biggest answer to hitler is the number of kids they have and grandkids they have and the fact that they were willing to push forward and continue to have and grow a family which of course is an amazing uh jewish response to tragedy so that's one reason another one that i i, I thought was really beautiful what was the difference between, here's a riddle, what was the difference between the Jewish census and the American census? So the difference is that in America, when we have a census, the head of a household will represent their household and they'll write how many people are at home and answer the questions. Here, it wasn't so simple. It wasn't like you just, the head of the house, you know, will report back, I got three, six, five, whatever amount I've got in my house but rather every single person who was counted was given the opportunity to go before Moshe and Aaron and be counted individually as a, as a unique human being, as a unique you know, Jewish person. They would have a moment to stand before the two greatest leaders of all time. And no doubt when that happened, there was a brief exchange. There was a little conversation. There was a bracha. There were, you know, the, I'm sure Moshe and Aaron took the opportunity to give that person a blessing or some guidance or some counsel. And that made people really realize how important they were and how worthy they were and that they have this 
connection to Jewish leaders as well. And Hashem wanted to show his love for every single unique individual in the Jewish people. So that's another reason why Hashem wanted to carry out the census and why it's talked about in the Torah. Um, on another more like technical level, this was in preparation for a military battle because the Jewish people had to conquer Israel. So in preparation for that, that's why the, the raw census number, the, the, basically the smallest number, which is the one in the Torah, is only men from age 20 and up because those are the ones who are uh, ready and able and were part of the mitzvah to take part in the battle. So that's why they were the ones who the focus was on. And then that number, of course, grows bigger as you're adding women and children. So that's on a, on a more technical level. Now, the funny thing here is that Levi, the tribe of Levi, was really unusually small. So they were, they were counted separately. They weren't, you know, so for the purpose of preparing for battle, Shevet Levi did not go to battle. So they didn't have to be part of that count. But also they were an exalted, holy, special tribe who had a different like life mission, basically, to be serving Hashem and doing that with the Mishkan. And therefore, they were counted, you know, off to the side on their own. Actually, they were counted from one month and up instead of from 20 years, because for the purpose of the uniqueness and mission of the Levi, 20 years isn't a, a number, isn't a, 20 years is a military number. But the merit of being a Levi is even when you're a newborn. So they were counted actually from one month because it was understood that a baby that's less than one month is not, hasn't really shown that they're a viable, healthy baby that will, you know, that will live on. I don't know, perhaps that's changed now with modern medicine. You know, I think people are not really like holding their breath until the first month, but, you know, for sure. And in, in this context, we wanted to know that that baby was, was healthy and, and going to make it before being counted in this. And then there's actually another number of ladies who were counted from age 30 to 50, which was the optimal time for serving in the Mishkan. Okay, enough technical stuff. So why is Levi so small? Levi was 22,000 strong. The next Shevet after that was nearly three times bigger uh, at 60,000, 59,000. And many of the tribes were way more than that. What happened to the tribe of Levi that they should be so small? And the Archaim asks, even furthermore, shouldn't they be the biggest? Aren't they the most unique and the most special? If you wanted to have one twelfth of the Jewish people who have a unique mission, you know, one tribe out of 12, we'd love for them to be the biggest one. Why are they so significantly smaller than every other tribe? Don't We need them most. <laughs> they should be the biggest one. Also, they didn't sin. They didn't do the sin of the eagle. They didn't, you know, they, they were more well-behaved as well. So if you want to talk in terms of merits, they should probably be worthy of, uh, of, of having the most merits and having more children. So the Ramban says, Nachmanides again, says something so powerful. He says, the, the Pasuk tells us, during the labor of Egypt, Ka'asher yanu oisai kein yirbe, as the Jewish people were oppressed and worked and tortured, so they increased. So the Jewish mothers during the, this time in Egypt had up to six children at once. And the Pasuk says that as they were being tortured, as they were being worked, so they had more and more kids. So that's why they merited such a huge population growth. But the tribe of Levi was off the hook. The tribe of Levi did not work in Egypt. They did not go through all of that backbreaking labor. They were given the ability to study Torah. It wasn't easy for them. It wasn't, it wasn't a vacation for them, but they didn't have the full oppression that the other Jewish people had. So the Ramban says that's why they weren't worthy to merit this incredible blessing. Because they weren't worked hard, they didn't have this special unique blessing that Hashem made that in accordance with the difficulty, so came along the blessing for, the, for them to grow. So I think that's a, a very powerful idea there in showing the blessing that often accompanies difficulty. And a lot of times we go through things in life 
and and it could be a package deal. We're we're going through what we need to go through for reasons that we often don't understand, but with this is coming along a whole lot of blessing. And it could sometimes be tempting to wish the hardships away. But if we do that, we don't know what kind of blessing we're, we're, we're leaving, we're taking away with that. We don't know what kind of growth we could experience on a personal level through going through the challenge. So we might not always want to just wish it away, even though that's how we feel we want to. Hashem was giving the maximum blessing to those who had the maximum work. So if you were part of Levi, you'd feel amazing that you're not being put to work in the land of Egypt. But fast forwarding and zooming out a little, they, they lost out on a tremendous amount of blessing because of that as well. But sometimes out of, out of the challenge comes the greatest outcome. And I heard a story uh, this week. So this week, uh, today, actually, earlier today was Rosh Chodesh Sivan. So on the day before Rosh Chodesh Sivan, called Erev Rosh Chodesh Sivan, it's a very auspicious time in the Jewish people for those who are familiar with the Tfilas Hashla. The Tfilas Hashla is a prayer that was written by uh, a very holy rabbi, the Shla, and it is a prayer specially for good children. It's a prayer to beg Hashem to give us children and to make our children who, who we already have um, grow up in the way of the Torah and be able to be worthy of fulfilling the word of Hashem and following in the way of Hashem in this world. And uh, I don't want to get into now why Erev Rosh Chodesh Sivan is a special time for that, but that's the time that a lot of times, you know, you might see circling on like Jewish social media or WhatsApp groups. Oh, today's the day to say Tfil Sashla, which is, which is truly a, a beautiful thing. Um, you know, you can Google it. I'm sure you'll find it. Very nice thing to say any day of the year, even if we missed Erev Rosh Chodesh. So I heard from a rabbi who was talking about the power of praying for the spiritual success of our children. And he said, there's a rabbi in Israel. Um, I'm forgetting his name. So I don't want to misquote him. I think... Mm -mm. Okay, I'm, I'm forgetting the name now, and I don't want to say the wrong one. So there's a very senior rabbi in Israel who's the head of a yeshiva. He's in his 90s, okay? That narrows it down. There isn't that many that are still active that are in their 90s. And he's been teaching for about five or six decades. And he said over, he said, I found a fascinating phenomena throughout the decades. He said thousands of people passed through his school, and he's seen many times brothers that would pass through his yeshiva. And Usually, nature is, people aren't always the same, even siblings, and sometimes there would be a brother that was much stronger in his Judaism, whether it's in his observance and, and carefulness with following halacha, or whether it's with his, you know, mental capacity or patience or ability to learn Torah for, you know, extended periods of time, etc. So that's just the way it is. Sometimes one brother is weaker. And he said time after time after time again, when I would fast forward many years, and look at where these guys are holding, the weaker brother is doing way better than the stronger brother. So if he chose a path of, you know, to follow his Torah education to teach Torah, then he very often, the weaker brother became a great rabbi, an educator, you know, a teacher of some sort. But even if he chose to take whatever profession he decided to go in, he was strongly rooted in his Judaism, and usually very successful in his business as well. And he said he doesn't know, you know, exactly why this happens, but he has a hunch. He said, for the boy who's doing well, he, he used the mother, but I feel like it could probably be the mother or father. He said, for the boy who was doing well in school, the mother prayed for his spiritual success. But for the boy who wasn't doing well, the mother cried for his spiritual success. So when the boy was weaker, the mother felt a, a sense of urgency. I don't know where my kid's heading. I don't know where he's gonna where he's gonna go. You know where he's gonna lead his life. Whether he's gonna follow in the way of the Torah, and that led her to shed tears in prayer over her child. And that's what he attributes the fact that these kids outpaced their other brother who were doing better, 
who the mother might be a little like, oh, okay, it's cool. You know, he's, he's doing, he's doing well, which is easy. You know, I, I can relate to the, to the concept of that. I just now, I, I think mo most of you probably know by now that I, I bought a house recently here in Jacksonville and it was quite a, it was quite a journey to get that. It wasn't, wasn't an easy process, horrible market to be buying a house. And for that time period that I was looking was like four months or so, I prayed a lot for it. And it was a real connecting point in, in my prayer. And like every morning I would really focus and I really, you know, daven for it. And the second I closed, boom, that all went away. I, I felt like I lost my connection because this was such a, this, I, it wasn't a good thing. It was like, it was stress. Let me tell you, it was a lot of stress. It wasn't like this pleasant, oh, Hashem, I'd love a house. It was a very stressful process and it kept me very connected. And when that was done, I, I came the next morning. I'm like, okay, what do I do now? Like, I, I almost felt like, like I lost out on that connection. I need to, you know, rebuild it somewhere else. I, I'd prefer not to have stresses that will, you know, require me to connect like that. I, you know, hopefully I can preempt that and, and, do that on my own. But sometimes it's it's the, the harder situations that lead to the closest connection to Hashem. So that's just a little lesson in this Ramban and this idea from Nachmanides in why Levi did not merit this incredible blessing. Now, there's a problem with this approach. The Arachayim says this cannot be accurate, okay, which is a very brave thing for the Arachayim to say. Archaim to say, because the Archaim lived 600 years after the Ramban. The Archaim was what we call an Achron from the later generation, and Ramban was an earlier Rishon. So it's very brave to argue on a Rishon. But the Archaim says that anyway, and he says it can't be. It can't be that the Jewish population grew during the time of the labor, of the hard efforts and the, and the slavery. And he explains why. He says the Pusik says, in the Medrash, that Yaakov saw 600,000 descendants. And we also know that Yaakov died before the slavery began. Yaakov did not see his kids being, you know, put to work like that. So if that's the case, that means the massive Jewish population boom happened before the slavery started. So it cannot be that in accordance with the oppression, the Jewish population grew because we're in a, a catch-22 with these other pieces of data that we know that it must be the Jewish population grew before. Okay, so what does it mean that in accordance with the pain, you know, came so they grew? He has other, like, other ways of explaining that, that it's not meant to be taken literally. So if that's the case, says the Arachayim, it cannot be that the tribe of Levi lost out on that because they weren't working because that population already, the growth already happened previously. So he needs to explain that. Now, by the way, in case you're worried about the Ramban and who's gonna defend the Ramban, there are many defenders of the Ramban and all of them is like literally the Archaim is like the only one who has a problem with the Ramban here, but others will come to, to the Ramban's defense and say, when the Medrash says that Yaakov saw 600,000 descendants, it is not meant to be taken literally. One opinion is that he saw a vision, a prophecy, that he was going to have 600,000 descendants. So he had that, you know, maybe peace of mind, you want to call it, before he died, that he knew that, that his children were going to grow. I'm, I'm sure when it was approaching his death, it was a very uncertain time. His kids are not in the land of Israel. They're in Egypt. They're, they weren't being put to work yet but they were only 70 strong. I can understand how reassuring that would be for Yaakov to know that his children are going to boom to 600,000. So that's what they explain. Actually, the Archaim himself gives an alternative understanding of what it means Yaakov saw 600,000. And he says in line with a, a more Kabbalistic idea that where he basically talks about how ho holy Jewish souls are brought into the world by a Jew bringing sparks of holiness to a non-holy place. So when a Jew does the will of Hashem in an environment that isn't conducive for that, which there is no greater example of than Egypt, which was considered the old day Las Vegas and 
many different areas and reasons. So Yaakov was able to bring out so much holiness, so many sparks of holiness from the contamination of Egypt that now 600,000 Jewish souls were ready to be brought into the world. That's what he talks about. And I always think about, we do that here also. We're in Jacksonville. We're not in the, you know, the, the, the heart of Jewish population center. We're very much a minority here. We're, we're dispersed amongst non-Jews. We work with non-Jews. And when we make a Kiddush Hashem, and when we show the people around us how beautiful the, the Jewish way is and how well we're acting and we sanctify Hashem's name, that is bringing a beautiful sparks of, of holiness into our world around us. So it's actually a little hard to understand if the Archaim himself says that explanation about that medrash, it doesn't really fit with what the Archaim says now. Okay, that we're getting into a little pilpal. We're getting into much deeper, deeper ideas there. Come back on Shavuos. Maybe we should do more, more of that kind of <laughs> in-depth learning. But that's a little bit of the idea of, of the Arachayim. Um, let me see if I missed any part of that. Oh, okay. So now the Arachayim wants to give his own answer because he doesn't like the Rambans. And he says, this is very interesting. Anyone who was not a Levi was in a very difficult position, obviously, during the exile of Egypt. And there was a lot of death and destruction around them. For a portion of the time, there was a decree from Pharaoh that every male baby boy who was born was going to be killed. But even before that, there were horrific decrees, and many children were killed just throughout the process of that. And there was a lot of, a lot of death around them. And the Archaim says that there was so much death and destruction and pain that it desensitized the Jewish people, and they became more tolerant of death. And because they became more tolerant of death, this is so interesting, they were willing to have kids. If they were, okay, so they were willing to have kids. And in contrast, the Levi, Levi was not in the thick of it. They weren't being put to work. They were, they were able to hold their, their self-esteem more. They were less desensitized to death. So they said, we don't want to have children. This is not a good place to have children. There's such a good chance that the kid's not going to live. And everybody else was like, yeah, you know, I guess there is a chance, but we're going to do it anyway. They pushed forward and they were like, you know, a little bit more willing to, to take that risk. So then there's a whole discussion. I don't want to get into all the details, the whole discussion of whether Levy was allowed to do that because there is a mitzvah to have children. So are you allowed to just say you're not going to have kids because it's a difficult situation. There's a Talmud that says in time of famine, one should not have kids, which seems to say that, you know, we, which seems to back up this idea that they didn't, but maybe they should have for at least the minimum fulfillment of the mitzvah of having children, which is to have one boy and one girl. But anyway, without getting into that, that's what Levi's mentality was that they were exempt from the mitzvah for various uh, halachic reasons, and therefore they didn't have kids. And the rest of the, the people who were maybe also exempt, they chose to have it anyway. And what I see from this, I'm, I'm not quoting anybody here, but I just want to point out, and, and God, forbid, I, God forbid, I don't mean to say anything negative about Shavit Levi, but if you zoom out and you look 200 years later, look at the results of that. The people who had a good excuse to be exempt from bringing more children into the world and chose not to, they had this massive, massive tribe to show for it. They had 100,000 members when they left Egypt. And, the, and Shavit Levi, who was, they didn't act incorrectly, but they chose to just follow the letter of the law of what they needed to do. They only had 22,000 strong which is a shame, which is a big shame because they are the people who are serving Hashem most. They are the ones who are serving in the Mishkan. Such a chaval. If one tribe had to be smaller, it should be any other and not Shevet Levi. But so I think the lesson here is, you know, sometimes, sometimes a lot of good could come from not following our good excuses, even if they're halachically sound excuses. If we push forward anyway and say, we're going to do it despite the, the difficulty here, despite the fact that maybe according to the letter of the law, we don't have to, only good could, could come from that. 
I remember when I was in Israel, I knew, uh, you know, some people who were so, so poor, and I knew how poor they were. And they, I, I used to see them giving charity, and it always baffled me, because they definitely should be the recipients of charity. And they were giving charity, and I have no doubt that they're exempt from giving charity, okay? If you qualify to receive charity, you don't need to give charity. So, so they, I mean, they, you fulfill a mitzvah from doing it for sure. But for them, it's not about that. It's not, a, it's about doing a mitzvah. It's about going above and beyond to be able to, to follow in the ways of Hashem. And I think, you know, the lesson here a little bit is that only, only good could come out of such a mentality. Okay, any, any questions or thoughts on anything we discussed? Rabbi, I'm just curious with um, the explanations that you've given um, in terms of the size of the uh, tribe. I, as, as you were speaking, I sat here and I wondered if, you know, if there were, if their like, blessing didn't come later down the line. And where I'm coming from is, when we read through the Tehillim, there are many Tehillims that really speak to the Levites. You know, they were the ones who would sing. So I wonder if in a sense, their numbers or their blessings have been increased through Tehillim. So that's my question. Excellent, okay. So I don't know if they had a special, um, a special blessing in, related to the content in Tehillim, but you are 100% right that following this whole story, they had a huge population growth, huge one. Actually, their population growth after this, I didn't get to that, but that was part of the essay of the Arachayim, was three times faster than anybody else's. So they start, they were a quarter of the size, but basically they caught up more or less at a very rapid rate. So there was another one of the commentaries that said that Levi was being punished for something, and that's why they were smaller. And the Archaim disagrees with that exactly because of this. He says if it was a punishment, they wouldn't have caught up later, essentially. That, you know, that's the basic idea. But yeah, after this, there was a lot of change. I'm sure we'll get to that you know, at, at a later parsha. Yeah. Okay, any more thoughts? <laughs> 